excited. You know, the last time we were together in chapter 3 here, in verses 5 through 9, we talked about religious scammers. Remember that? And the fact that they're out there, they try to use religion for their own selfish purposes. But after Paul warns Timothy about these religious scammers, Paul basically points to himself, and he reminds Timothy about his own life. And the fact, hey, they're not all scammers, in other words. Look at me, Timothy. And Timothy was like Paul's son. And, and you know, Paul was like a dad to Timothy. They had a very close relationship. And Timothy knew that Paul was the real deal. He knew he was genuine. And, you know, it, it's really easy to get cynical when spiritual leaders hurt us or disappoint us or let us down or fall. But we need to focus on and remember people who have influenced us in our lives for Christ who have been faithful and they have kept a good testimony for Christ. Hey, listen, they're, they're, all spiritual leaders have faults and failures. Um, we're human. <laughs> there, there are no perfect spiritual leaders. There are no perfect pastors. <laughs> I'll have to get a big amen right there. There's no perfect deacons. How come there wasn't this big amen on that one? There are, listen, your life, your teacher, he or she is not perfect. They're not perfect. But having said that, there are spiritual leaders, people in our life, followers of Christ, who have been very faithful. They, they're not perfect, but they've been true to their spouse. They've been honest in their dealings. They've exhibited financial integrity. They've been very giving, very sincere in God's work. They've lived sacrificially in order to serve the Lord. They've stayed solid in regards to the Bible and in regards to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people in our lives that we can look at and say, wow, they have been faithful. They have been exemplary. And that's what our text is about today. You see, all of us in here have the ability to influence others for Christ. You are a leader to somebody. You have influence in someone else's life. Now, unless you live in a bubble, or unless you've been on a deserted island for 10 years, okay, there is someone that you that is looking to you as a leader. There's someone who looks up to you. There's someone uh, that you have influence over. Now, maybe your influence isn't major, but you've got some influence in their life. You know, all of you are, who are parents, who you still have kids or teenagers at home, obviously, you are a major influencer in your kids' life. Either for good or bad, you are a major influence. If you've got grandkids, you're an influence. Maybe you've got nieces or nephews, you're an influence. Uh, maybe it's coworkers, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's friends. You have people that you have influence over. So the question then is how can we be godly spiritual leaders? How can we take that influence that we have and use it for Christ and use it for good? What are the marks, what are the characteristics of a godly leader? Somebody who's taking the influence that they have and really using it to help other people. You know, Paul, basically in this text, he is going to kind of turn his focus away from the scammers. He's going to say, now look, don't get cynical, Timothy, because of all these scammers out here. I want you to remember me. And he's going to say, Timothy, remember me. Remember my life. And he's going to talk about the leader that he's been to Timothy. And there's just so much to learn, so much good stuff here. And so uh, this is something, like I said, unless you live in a bubble, all right, this is something that every one of us in here needs. This is something that every one of us can learn from. This is something that every one of us can apply to our life today, right now, today. And so I'm going to give you, from the text, verses 10, 11, and 12, I want to give you four characteristics of godly leaders. Four characteristics of people who are having a good, positive influence for Christ in other people around them. Number one, you ready? Number one is this. If you got your hand out, the first thing I want you to get is this. Godly leaders maintain a solid belief system. Paul says to Timothy, look at verse 10. Look at that. I want everybody to look at that. Look at verse 10. He says, Timothy, but... In other words, they're not all like these religious scammers. He says, but you have fully known my doctrine. 
Timothy, I know there's a lot of charlatans. I know there's a lot of deceivers. I know there's a lot of scammers out there. But friend, he says, you have fully known my doctrine. First thing he mentions is doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine isn't just a Bible word. Doctrine is a term that's even used out in the world, right? You've heard of the Monroe Doctrine and different things like that. Doctrine is your belief system. That's all it is. Your, everybody has a doctrine. Everyone has a belief system. Some people believe in God. Some people believe in Allah. Some people believe in a multiplicity of gods. Some people say, I believe in me. I believe in myself. You know, Everybody has a belief system. A doctrine. And your belief system, in your handout, it says that is the foundation for your life. And then the very next thing says we all, typically, we all act in accordance with what we believe. We typically act in accordance with what we believe. All right? For example, I'll just throw out a few examples. Again, I'm not condemning anyone. Everyone's free to make their own choices. I'm just making some observations. And I want to point out some differences. Some people are consumed with saving whales. Or gopher turtles. Or some other species of animal. And that's fine. But that's what they're all about. I mean, that's what they that's what they raise money for. They raise awareness. They blog about it. They put it on Facebook. They send out tweets about it. They're about, for example, we'll just throw out that saving whales. Alright. And that's what they're about. That's fine. Other people are about saving trees. And they feel like that's really important. I've got to save trees. Other people are all about saving money. And they want to try to make money and save money. And they want to try to build up their, their bank accounts and all of their different funds. And they're all about saving money. That's what they, what they believe to be very important. So you got people who wake up every morning. Man, they're all about saving whales. Other people about saving trees. Other people about saving money. And then there's other people who are all about saving souls. They're all about saving souls. They, they, there's certain people in life that they are about getting the good news of Jesus out to people because they believe that not only will the good news of Jesus change people's eternal destiny, they believe that the message of Jesus will transform people's life right here on this earth. Amen. And so they're all about saving souls. Now, again, I'm not condemning anything. I'm just pointing out why the difference? Why the difference? Why would some people be about saving whales and other saving trees and other saving money and other saving souls? Why the difference? Their belief system. Their doctrine. What is your worldview? Because that's your doctrine. That's your belief system. What is your worldview? Paul taught that a Christian should have a biblical worldview. Paul taught that a Christian who claims to know the Lord should look at everything through the lens of God's Word. Just like I'm looking through these lens at you. Boy, I can see you good, too. <laughs> Don't sleep, because I can see you. I got my lens on here, all right? But, but, you know, I'm looking at you through the lens of my glasses, and so if you have a biblical worldview, you look at everything through the lens of what God says. So when you hear something on the news, you look at it through the lens of God's Word. When you hear something... In the high school or college classroom, you look through the lens of God's Word. What does it say? Whenever you read something on the web or, you know, whenever you hear, uh, see something on a TV program or see something on a movie, right away you're going to look at it through the lens of God's Word. Why would we do that? A biblical worldview. Our attitude is, hey, you know what? God is always right. So if, 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 if somebody says something that's contradictory to what God has said... Guess what? They're wrong and God is right. Amen. That's a biblical worldview. This is our final authority. We look at every three, everything through the lens of God's Word. How do you view your life? What do you think the purpose of your life is? How do you view this world system? Hopefully, you view your life and you view this world system through the lens of God's Word. You have a biblical worldview. Paul constantly emphasized to young Timothy the importance of sound doctrine, a sound belief system, and then deriving that belief system from the Bible. If you look at chapter 4, flip over to
to chapter 4 real quick. And look at verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 2. What's the first three words, guys? Preach the word. Preach the word. Timothy, stick with the word, man. It may not be popular. You may not like it. But you preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, love, long suffering, and doctrine. Look at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear what the Bible says. But after their own lusts, Shall they heed to themselves, teachers having each year? Tell us what feels good. Tell us what's going to make us feel good. Tell us what, you know, tell us something that won't be fuzzy. Tell me something I want to hear. Tell me something that will make me feel good. Tell me something that will make me feel better about You know, and so he says they're going to have itching ears. Look at verse number four. And they shall turn away their ears from the what? The truth. And shall be turned unto fables. He says they're going to turn their ears away from the Bible, sound doctrine. And their belief system is going to be based on fables, men's opinions, men's ideas, uh, you know, uh, uh, stories they've heard, philosophy they've heard. They're going to be turned into fables. If we are going to be godly leaders, if we're going to influence people the right way, and I know all of you want to do that, we have to maintain a solid belief system. We've got to be rock solid. And we, and we have to base our doctrine, our belief system, on the Word of God. Are y'all with me so far? Yeah. Alright, number two. The second mark of a godly spiritual leader is that their walk matches their talk. It's one thing to say you believe the Bible, but you know what our motto is at Crossroads, right? Learning the Bible. What? Yeah. Living the Bible. Right. So your walk matches your talk. Be honest, how many of you have ever met somebody who was all talk? <laughs> you ever had have you ever met somebody like that? Man, I mean they talk big. <laughs> they talk big, but they're short on delivery. <laughs> Some people talk a good game, but that's all it is, is talk. Don't you love people who can talk a blue streak about politics and about what's wrong with our country, but they never vote? Don't, don't, don't you love people that can just tell you how to play quarterback in the NFL, but they've never even played quarterback in high school? <laughs> you know? Here's a real funny one. When Pastor Dan tries to go into the kitchen and tell Denise how to cook. <laughs> now that's a joke. I tried that when we were young Marys. Tried to tell Denise, hey, you put in that rind, maybe you should have some more seasoning. Finally, she just said, how many meals have you cooked? I said none. <laughs> How many dishes have you prepared? Not even a whole meal, just a dish. I said none. None. Never. I've never prepared a dish of any sort. I made toast. She said that didn't count. <laughs> so in Christian love and charity, she hit me over the head with a frying pan. <laughs> Not as kid, she did me. She did say, she did say to me, she said, the biggest way you can help me in the kitchen is to get out. So I've obeyed that ever since. But some people, their walk doesn't match their talk. Well, that creates an integrity crisis. The Pharisees were that way. The Pharisees, man, they were the religious leaders in Jesus' day, and they talked about the Bible, and talked about God's laws, and talked about the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments, and they talked about all this stuff. Then they'd go over here and extort money from some little old widow. Or they go over here and take some guy's property away from him. They used their religious position for personal gain. They were so bad that Jesus finally just said, he just flat out told people, hey, do what they say, but don't do what they do. Well, that's the opposite of what Paul tells Timothy. Look at verse 10. He says, uh, I'm back in chapter 3 again, by the way. Go back to chapter 3, verse 10. He says, Timothy, you have fully known my doctrine. And then what's the next thing he says? <laughs> manner of life. You have fully known my manner of life. You know what fully known means? It means to follow near. Have you ever had anybody get in your space and follow you around and shadow you? And you're like, give me some space. And that's the idea. He says, Timothy, you have shadowed me. My little son, my little grandson, Connor, he's one and a half. He follows you wherever you go. I mean, you go in the living room, he goes to the living room. You go in the family room, he goes to the family room. He wants to be wherever you are. He shadows you everywhere you go. You go in the bathroom, he goes in the bathroom. <laughs> and, and that's the idea of follow near. 
is that is, is, is he says, you have fully known, you have followed me, or Timothy, you have been near to me. In fact, the MEV, which is the modern English version, it's just a modern King James version, it actually uses the word observed. He says, you have observed my manner of life. That's a great word, observed. I love that word. Because you've heard the expression, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Has anybody else heard that? <laughs> I'm from Missouri, and they call Missouri. Does anybody know? Show me say. I was talking to a guy yesterday, Randy Price. Many of you know Randy. He's not doing well. He's probably only got a couple days to live. And I was visiting him yesterday. Please pray for Cheryl, his wife. But I was visiting him, and one of the nurses said, so where are you from? I said, Missouri. He goes, show me state. I said, yeah. I said, do you know what that means? He goes, no. <laughs> no, I don't know what that means. He said, but I'll take a guess. I said, what do you think that means? He said, well, I, I think it means that if you were from Missouri, he said, then you had to show you before you would believe it. You couldn't just tell you. You had to show you. Show me, say. you got to show me before I believe it. That's exactly what it meant. I said, have you ever heard the expression stubborn as a Missouri mule? He said, yeah. I said, people from Missouri were known for being very stubborn. Now, of course, I'm not that way. But they were very stubborn, and you had to show them before they would believe you. Paul said, you have fully known, you've observed my manner of life. Manner of life means mode of living. Your manner of life is not just talking about Sunday, although that's part of your life. But I mean, how many of you have a life outside of church? Raise your hand if you have a life outside of church. Every hand should go up. I don't think anybody lives here 24-7. Do we have any monks that live here all week? All right. So we all have a life outside of church. And so when he says you've known my manner of life, what he's saying is that your manner of life has to do with what kind of employee you are on Monday at work. Your manner of life has to do with how you talk to your wife on Tuesday, how you treat your kids on Wednesday, how you treat your neighbor at home on Thursday, how you treat the waitress in the restaurant, how you deal with her on Friday. That's your manner of life. And he says, Timothy... You have known what I believe, but you've also known my manner of life, that my walk matches my talk. Timothy had watched Paul day in and day out. They had, they, they had traveled together, lived together, labored together, eaten together, and man, I would assume they had drunk coffee together. Amen? <laughs> so Paul was very sincere and very real. He did not use people and use his position as an apostle to take advantage of people, to try to live an extravagant lifestyle. In fact, look at your handout. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians. It's at the bottom of your handout there. Isn't this a great text? Paul says, when we came to you there in Thessalonica, he says, he says, neither at any time did we come with flattering words, as you know. He said, we didn't come with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from men either from you or from others, even though we might have made demands as the apostles of Christ. You know what Paul was? Paul was a giver, not a taker. Mm -hmm. Paul says, we did not come there to try to get in your back pocket. Paul was real. His walk matched his talk. Now, statistics show, you know why many kids and teenagers... You know why they, they abandon the church when they get to be adults? This isn't the only reason. Trust me. Kids got to make their own decisions. They got to live their own life. You can raise kids to the best of your ability, but then they have to make their own decisions. So there's other factors. But they say statistically that one of the major reasons why kids and teenagers abandon the church when they get to be adults is they observe hypocrisy from their parents. Their parents were one way at church. And then they were another way at home. If you want to influence people for Christ, be real. Notice I didn't say be perfect. There's a difference between being real and being perfect. You see, being perfect means you never mess up. Guess what? That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. You're, you're not ever going to reach a point where you don't mess up. Every leader makes mistakes. Okay? Parents... All parents make mistakes. 
Pastors make mistakes. Policemen make mistakes. Judges make mistakes. School teachers make mistakes. Umpires and referees in sports make mistakes. Doctors make mistakes. You know, being, being real means that you admit when you mess up. And you try to improve and not do it again. It's just being real. I saw a video about a dad who was writing a letter to his son who now had three kids of his own. And this dad's writing his, this letter to his son, who's now a dad, and he's reminding him that he'll always be a leader to those kids. They're always going to look to him. And he's encouraging him to step up and be real and point him to Jesus. Would y'all like to see that video? Yeah. I'd like to show it to you. Y'all say yes? Yes. yes. All right, good. Can we go ahead and cue it up? Watch this video. After every catch he makes on the baseball field, he'll look to you to make sure you're smiling. When her friends make the fourth grade pass squad, but she doesn't, she'll look to you for comfort. When she feels misunderstood by her brothers and sisters, she'll look to you for understanding. They'll never stop looking to you. When she walks down the aisle on that magical day, she'll look to you to bring peace to her anxious heart. When he plays his first concert with his new band, he'll look to your face in the crowd. When she makes choices that will break your heart, she'll eventually look to you for forgiveness and restoration. They'll never stop looking to you. And you can never stop. You must never stop looking to God. They don't need you to be perfect. They just need you to be authentic and offer them Jesus anyway. They need you to try your very best. And even if you fail, they need to see you rise up again. They need you to fall hard after Jesus as best you can because they will never stop looking to you. Son, I'm writing these words to you because you are, and always have been, the legacy I wanted to leave. And now, it's your moment. It's your chance to leave the legacy of loving Jesus with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. They'll never stop looking to you, and that's the way God Created it to me. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Let me give you the third point. Number three is that a godly leader who is influencing others for good, their purpose is to glorify Christ. What if somebody asked the five people closest to you who know you the best? what your primary purpose in life is. What would they say about you? The five people who know you the best, it could be family, friends, a coworker, five people that know you the best, what would they say is your reason for getting up every morning? What would they say is your passion? What is the purpose of your life? Look at verse number 10. Paul said, you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, and he said, Timothy, you have known my purpose, man. And you know what Paul's purpose was? Look at your handout at Philippians 1, 20 and 21. This describes Paul's purpose in a nutshell. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. And he says, accordingly, he said, it's my earnest expectation and my hope that I shall be ashamed in nothing, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ will be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death, for to me to continue living is Christ, and to die is gain. And so as Paul writes this, he's in prison, and he's like, you know what? I got 
this tug of war, man. He's like, I'm in the middle here between two choices. He says, I'm in prison, and they could come and execute me at any moment. But if I die, that's gain because I'm with Jesus in heaven. He says, but if I live and I survive this thing somehow, he says, then I get to stay and impact your lives for Christ. And I get to influence you for Jesus. So he's like, I can go either way with this. But he said, you know what? You know what the bottom line is? He said, no matter which way this thing goes, I just want Jesus to be magnified in my body. Whether I die or whether I stay here for a while, that's what I'm all about. I'm all about Jesus. I'm all about glorifying Him. And as you read verse 10, the rest of that verse, it just kind of shows you Paul's desire to glorify Christ. Those things in verse 10, you can't buy those with money. Those, those come from a purposeful walk with Christ. Look at verse 10. He says, you fully know my faith. Timothy had seen Paul trust Christ in every type of situation. He says, you have known my long suffering. You know what long suffering is? Long suffering is when you continue on for Christ despite attacks and trials and problems. You fully know. Look at the next one. He said, you've known my charity. Paul had a sacrificial love for people that led him to be very generous and very giving. He said, you've known my patience. And that word patience means a cheerful endurance through difficulties, persecutions. Which leads right into the next verse. And look at that with me. Verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. Those are three different cities. In fact, by the way, guys, at Lystra, they stoned Paul, left him for dead. And God miraculously raised him up. He says, Timothy, you know what hardship and pain I went through? Look at that. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And guess what? Paul knew that his hardship was not unique to him. Look at verse 12. He says, yes. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know what Satan wants to do with your pain? We all go through pain. Man, we all go through hard times. Satan wants to use your pain and your hardship and your problems and your trials. He wants to use those things to discourage you, to get you bitter. And in your handout, to cause you to quit. That is what he wants to do. He wants to cause you to quit. Godly leaders, number four, they stay faithful during times of suffering. Um, I'm going to bring up on the screen here, there are two mindsets that people have in regard to suffering. Look at this with me on the screen. The first mindset, and I've seen this through the years, the first mindset, whenever suffering, you lose your job, financial turnaround, you get a health issue, a health problem, your spouse walks out on you, there's all kinds of suffering. Your kids disappoint you. you got all these different kinds of suffering. There's two attitudes. Number one, the first attitude is, God owes it to me to bless me and keep me from suffering. I mean, I'm a good person. I go to church. I try to be nice to other people. And you know what? I just think God kind of owes it to me to bless me and keep me from this suffering. The second mindset is, I owe it to God to suffer for His name. And I consider it a privilege. That first mindset that you're looking at, I guarantee you, if that's a person's mindset, they will not endure when suffering comes. They will get bitter at God, blame God, and quit on God. But if your mindset is that second one, you will endure victoriously through suffering, and you'll even do it with joy and with peace. And in your handout, I don't have time to read it, but I put in your handout a passage for you to read this week where the apostles were taken and beaten. You say, wow, what they do wrong? All they did was preach Jesus. And they took them, the leaders took them, and whipped them, and beat them, and flogged them. And the Bible says they went away rejoicing that they were, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for Jesus. And they didn't quit preaching and teaching Jesus. They're like, hey, it's our privilege to suffer for Jesus' name. And we're going to keep on keeping on. 
Timothy had quite an example in Paul, didn't he? He was a spiritual father to Timothy and a great influence in his life. Now, I want you to think with me. I'll stay with me about one more minute. And here's what I want you to do. I want everybody in here to think right now in your mind. Are there spiritual leaders, people that have had great influence on your life? Are there people that have had great influence in your life? Probably because they exhibited these four marks to some degree as we talked about today. They had a solid belief system. They, they walked the talk. They glorified Christ. They stayed faithful even during times of suffering. But now here's the key. Now God wants you to have that same influence on somebody else. And you can do it. I'm your cheerleader. I say you can do it. I say you can do it. I'm cheering you on. I'm saying, hey, those kids in your life, those teenagers, that niece, that nephew, that, that neighbor across the street, I'm telling that co-worker, I'm telling you that you can be a positive influence. You can influence them for good and for Jesus' sake. Amen. You can do it. Amen. You can do it. And what I would encourage you to do is take this message home and study it like crazy this week. And study 2 Timothy, the passage with it. And look at the leader Paul was. And if he can do it, you can do it. I guarantee you. Let's pray right now. I'm going to have the ushers prepare.